Hello, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. This, is, this should be the conclusion of Jacob's trouble. And the title of this is, who is Jacob Israel? Now, those of you that have been listening to me for a while, a lot of this material is going to be old stuff, but you got to realize something. I have to do my studies as if somebody's brand new and has never heard any of my previous work before. Now, I uh, did a... I'm trying to raise awareness, and I put a petition on the White House uh, petitions website asking for to make July White History Month. You know, Caucasians. Well, let's face it. You know, you've got. Uh, let's see. You've got. Uh, you've got a Black History Month. Okay, that's in February. Women's History Month is in March. Asian History Month and shares a month with Jewish History Month in April. And then you got Gay Pride in June, Hispanic Latino in September, and then Native American in November. And I ask, are whites who invented the automobile, the airplane, jets, trains, ocean liners, telephone, radio, television, computers, AC electricity, air conditioning, refrigerators, are, are, are not they, those that have invented all these numerous inventions, making up our modern civilization not worthy of a month? Why is this racist? Why would a white, hist white history month be racist? And uh, if you look below in the comments or in the description, there is going to be a link to the White House petition. You can sign it. If I can get um, over, I think it's 160 signatures, it'll be listed on the White House website. And if we get over 20,000, um, you know, maybe uh, the president will sign a proclamation making White History Month. Now, I'm not doing this out of pride. I know exactly what the Bible says about pride. You know, pride goeth before the fall and destruction, and I'm paraphrasing, but I know exactly what pride is. And I'm not doing this for pride. This is just to call awareness so that I want to wake up the Christians going, oh, wait a minute, we've, we've got Indian and Hispanics and gays, Jewish, Asian, women, black. Why is a white history month, why is that racist? You know, that's why I'm doing this. You know, I want to show them what's the liberal media. They will absolutely have a fit. Matter of fact, I might even lose my job over this. And if there's any fallout at all, I'm going to retire immediately. So, uh, you know, but let's take a look. Who is Israel from the Bible alone? Let's take a look. Does the Bible identify who Israel is? Now, if you listen to the black Hebrews, they will tell you oh, it's the Negroes from Africa. Yep, they're definitely, they're definitely Israel according to them because there's a verse in the Bible that says, I am black and we, we was in slavery. That's what they'll tell you. Then you got uh, the Mormons that say the American Indians, that they're Israel. And you've got a group in Japan that says, well, they're Israel, the chosen people. And then you got the John Hagees and TBN people and the 700 prophets of Baal uh, that say, well, you know, the, the people that call themselves Jews over in the Middle East, uh, Tel Aviv, and Jerusalem, the, they're Israel. And uh, then you got the uh, La Raza group and Hispanics, and they... Some of them say that they're Israel. 
But if the Caucasians, the whites, say that they're Israel, oh, that's an identity, horrible hate group, white supremacists, white supremacists, they're evil, they're racist. So why is that? You know, I mean, let's face it, the white culture and race um, has invented the modern civilization today. I mean, if it wasn't for Nikolai Tesla, whose both his grandparents were Christian clergy, by the way, and he was a Christian. Of course, they'll lie and say he wasn't. But uh, if it wasn't for him, it, learning how to turn magnetism into electricity by way of generators, I mean, we wouldn't have modern electricity unless you know somebody else invented it, but he did. And he tried to give everybody free power, but the powers that be, the rich bankers, said, free power? We can't have that. We can make money on this. They shut him down. And, you know, the rest is history. So, you know, Nikolai Tesla, I'm looking forward to meeting him in the kingdom. And Thomas Edison, I'm going to wave uh, bye-bye to him when he gets thrown into the lake of fire. If, you know, I don't make that decision who goes where, but uh, based upon... Edison's life and uh, what he loved, money, um, I would venture that would be a good guess as to where he's going to end up. All right, so let's take a look at the claims that uh, who is Israel? What does the Bible say? Because let's face it, people, whoever Israel is, is going to be the object of Satan's wrath in the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Now, if you, you know, I've done, what, four previous studies where I've gone through all this stuff. I mean, it's like a couple of hours of Bible studies where I document Jacob's name was changed by the Lord himself to Israel. And it's, you know, whoever Jacob is, they're going to be the recipients of the wrath of Satan, the dragon, the devil, in the time of what they call the Great Tribulation. So let's take a look. All right, let's take a look at the, uh, the claims of the black Hebrews, so-called. And uh, we'll take a look at everywhere... Where the Bible says the word black. All right, let's take a look. Now, in the book of Leviticus, 13th chapter, 31st and 37th verse, it talks about black hair. Okay. And, uh, well, let's take a look. In Job chapter 30 and verse 30, it says, My skin is my skin is black upon me, and my bones are burnt with heat. Huh. Okay. Well that yeah, that's that's it, right? So let's uh let's take a look. All right, uh let's see what verse are we gonna start here with? Let's read Job 30 and verse 25. Now remember, Job is being persecuted. Did not I weep for him that was in trouble? Was not my soul grieved for the poor? When I looked for good, then evil came unto me. And when I waited for light, there came darkness. My bowels boiled and rested not. The days of affliction prevented me. I went mourning, not not morning and afternoon, but mourning as in a death in the family. You mourn. I went mourning without the sun. I stood up and I cried in the congregation. I am a brother to dragons. And if you don't know what dragons are in the Bible, it says that old dragon 
that old serpent called the dragon, the devil, and Satan. That's in the book of Revelation. Okay. I am a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. My skin is black upon me and my bones are burnt with heat. Okay. My harp also is turned to mourning and my organ in the voice of them that wept. Okay. So his skin's black. That proves it, right? Plus they say, well, you know, blacks, we were in slavery. Well, I hate to tell you people, but every race has been in slavery at one time or another. Matter of fact, um, you ever heard of being Shanghai? There was a place, a city in China called Shanghai, and they used to kidnap people and knock them over the head, knock them out, and then they'd wake up out in the middle of the ocean on a ship and say, oh, by the way, you're our new ship hand. And if you don't want to work on our ship, well, we'll just throw you overboard and you can swim home. Which is kind of hard to do when you're, you know, 50 miles from the nearest land, right? So, let's take a look at uh, the Song of Solomon. Uh, take a look at Solomon, number chapter 1. And it says, I am black. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. And there are people who tell you Solomon was a sodomite because he's writing this. But, you know, he's speaking in the spiritual sense of God with Israel as a bride with her beloved. A lot of symbolic language here. Verse 3. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. And that's what God wants of his church. A virgin bride. Good luck with that today. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. I am black. Ooh, right there, that proves. Black Hebrews, right? I am black, but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. Oh, is that why the, they're black? Because of the sun. Or were they born that way before they even ever saw set their eyes on the sun? Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where, do, uh, where do thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, the fairest among women? Ooh, okay. Now, are they talking about when they say fair, are they talking about people playing a board game like Monopoly, where they're not cheating? Or are they talking about a description of their countenance or their complexion? Remember Cinderella? Or was it Cinderella? I forget which one it was, but the, the Wicked Witch would go on the, you know, uh, she was had the magic mirror, and she go mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Or was that? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Snow White. Ooh, Snow White. What color is snow? Yeah, white. That's right. I, it wasn't Cinderella. It was you know, uh, Snow White. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Okay. 
Well, let's take a look at something here. What is, uh, what's, what does fair mean? Fair, an adjective, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary. And let me tell you something. Webster was a language scholar. He spoke over 20 different languages. He knew the root words of multiple languages. The guy knew Bible Hebrew, which is the Old Testament. He knew Bible Greek, which was the New Testament. He knew Latin. He knew German, French, Spanish, and English. He codified the English language, standardized the spelling. He spent a large portion of his life putting all the words into a dictionary. And he was a Christian believer. When you look up in Webster's 1828, the original dictionary, the Bible words like sanctification and sacrifice and judgment. I mean, the words line up exactly with what the Bible teaches because the guy could read the Bible in the original languages. He was a scholar in every sense of the word. But now they take the word gay and it means a sodomite. Uh, they've destroyed. All right, the word fair, it's an adjective. It means clear, free of spots, free from a dark hue. A dark hue. You know what hue, a hue is? It's a shade of color. Free from a dark hue. White as a fair skin, a fair complexion, Hence, it also means beautiful, handsome, properly having a handsome faith. Um, and he quotes the Bible here. Thou art a fair woman to look upon. Genesis 12, 11. Pleasing to the eye, handsome or beautiful in general. Thus was be fair in its greatness in the length of his branches. Ezekiel 31, 3. Clear, pure, free from F-E-C-U-L-E-N-C-E. -E -E, I don't know what that means. Or extraneous matter as fair water. Clear, not cloudy or overcast, as fair weather, a fair squat, sky. Favorable, prosperous, blowing in a direction towards the place of a destination, as a fair wind at sea. Remember, they had sailing ships back in them days. So a fair wind was a, a good wind, right? Uh, open, direct, as a way or passage, you are in a fair way up to promotion. Hence, likely to succeed. He stands as fair to succeed as any man. Uh, open to attack or access, unobstructed as a fair mark, a fair but fair in sight, in fair in fair sight, in fair view. Okay, I mean, it's got a lot of different meanings here, and I could go on and, and on and on and on. But the word fair, the first meaning is clear, free of spots, free of a dark hue, white as a fair skin or fair complexion, hence. Now, let me tell you something. You can be, if you're a white person and you're out in the sun a lot, you can, your skin can turn black. I knew a guy I went to high school with. He used to, we used to live out in the sun when we were kids and he had an Afro and his skin was black. We used to joke about him, you know, about, uh, his mother or his father, or, well, his father, you know, different father than the rest of the kids. Because almost all the rest of the kids had blonde, white hair. Not him. He had kind of dark. So he was dark. So, fair. All right, let's take a look. All right, let's go back to Song of Solomon. If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way. forth by the footsteps of the flock, and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tent. That's Song of Solomon 1 and verse 8. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. We will make thee borders of gold with studs of silver, while the king sitteth at his table. My spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. Spikenard was just a, like what they used for perfume back in the days. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. Didn't know the Bible was racy, huh? 
My beloved is unto me as a cluster of campfire in the vineyards of En Gedi. Hmm. Forgive my reading. Behold, thou art fair. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes. Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, yea, pleasant also our bed is green. The beams of our house are cedar and our rafters of fir. So, let's take a look at some more. Uh, let's see. In Song of Solomon, 5 and 11, it says, His head is as the most fine gold. Um, have you ever looked at somebody, a white person that's been out in the sun, and they say, oh, he has a golden complexion. You know? His head is the most fine gold. His locks are bushy. What are locks? Locks of hair. They're not talking about master locks with a key. Okay. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. Can't somebody have a golden complexion and have locks of bushy black hair? Okay. Right? And if you read the rest, in Lamentations, 5 and verse 10, our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine, not because I was born that way when I came out of my mother's womb. Okay. Um, but that is the extent of the black Hebrews arguments. Is it 100% nailed shut? I don't think so. All right. Well, uh, I don't, I think that, you know, we're not completely done scratching the black Hebrews off the list yet. There'll be more to come that's going to show that this can't possibly be true. Let's take a look at the Native American Indians. And while we're at it, the uh, Hispanics. You know, the brown and the red. All right. Now, the Mormons believe that the American Indians are part of Israel. And you got to understand something. In the book of Doctrines and Covenants, which is by one of their prophets, they say that Satan... And Jesus, our brothers. And they'll say, well, we use the King James Bible. But then when you when you talk to them, uh, they'll say, well, you know, we use the King James Bible, but it's full of errors. And that's why Gabriel had to come down. And or I'm sorry, not Gabriel, but um, that was the uh, Muslims. The uh, they'll say, well, that's why the angel Moron I, M-O-R-O-N. I, you got it because I, I would be a moron to believe Joseph Smith's angel that came down and gave him all this information. But they said, oh, well, you know, the Bible's an error, and that's why we had to come up with another gospel. Well, Paul said that if any, even uh, if they or an, even an angel from heaven came down with any other gospel, let him be accursed. Well, Mormons are cursed. They say that Jesus is the brother of Satan. Do you want Satan's brother for your savior? I say, no, absolutely not. But they'll they'll hand you a King James Bible and say, oh yeah, you know, we, we use the King James Bible, but they don't believe it because they say it's an error. But let's take a look. What about the American Indians? Can they possibly be the um, chosen people, according to the Book of Mormons? Well, let's take a look at Webster's Dictionary again. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see where it leads. Okay? 
Now in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 42, we read the following. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. What does countenance mean? It's talking about a complexion. If you have a fair countenance, you have a fair complexion. Well, that pretty much nails to the cross, so to speak, the black Hebrews. If, you know, if you have a fair, there's no Negro has a fair complexion. Impossible. Now, ruddy basically means red. Let's take a look at ruddy. It's an adjective. Webster's 1828. Of a red color. Of a lively flesh color or the color of the human skin in high health. Women, you ever put rouge on your face? Rouge is a French word that means red. They call it blush. It ha you know, when, when people blush, okay? Thus we say, ruddy cheeks, ruddy lips, a ruddy face or skin, a ruddy youth, and in poetic language, ruddy fruit, but the world is chief, but the word is chiefly applied to the human skin. Okay. What does that do to the black Hebrews? That pretty much nails the thing shut. Now, the American Indians, hey, they can have they have ruddy skin. I totally admit it. Yes, they do. They are red. They even call them red men, right? Red engines. But they're not fair. But they're not fair. They're not white. And any white person can have reddish colored skin, either from the blood or from being out in the sun. So again, does, does that, you know, what does it mean to be fair? Well, we read it, right? So... Uh, let's see. Let's take a look. How about the Asians? Uh, the only Asians that even come, uh, talk about being the children of Israel, there's a very, very, very small group in Japan. Okay. Let's take a look at the Song of Solomon, chapter 5 and verse 10. It says, my beloved is white. Ooh, that's racist, isn't it? My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. Okay, you can be white, you can be ruddy. What does that do to the American Indians? Impossible, right? What about the Hispanics that are brown? Are they white and ruddy? Uh, no. In the verse of Lamentations, chapter 4, and verse 7. Now remember... Oh, uh, Samson was a, took a, a, a Nazarite vow not to drink wine. And I think, you know, not cutting the hair too. I never did understand that. You know, I mean, if you don't cut your hair, it's going to get long. And I don't know, you know, Paul said that it was a shame for a man to have long hair. Uh, you know, Samson probably looked like the modern rock star, you know up on stage with this guitar, you know, long hair and a beard. And... So, Lamentations 4-7. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. What group of people have white skin, you know, whiter than milk? They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. I'm not making this up. I mean, let's face it, people. Who printed the Bibles? A German by the name of Gutenberg, which means good mountain. Guten means good. Or gut. Good. Uh, if I said, das Bier ist gut, that means this beer is good. And I said that many times when I was in Germany. 
when I was in the army and I was a, what, 18, 19 year old punk. Now I'm a 60 year old punk, but I'm not so young anymore. Now I'm an old punk. But um, Gut and Berg means mountain. You've ever heard of icebergs? That means ice, a mountain of ice, ice mountain. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. Okay. You know, what does the Bible say about white? In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, scarlet's kind of a reddish color, right? Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Hmm. Why is it that sins are likened unto red? Now, you know, the Bible even says that great red, dra uh, great red dragon. Why is red symbolized with the dragon, the devil, Satan? And sin. But then it says they're going to be turned white. Weren't we washed in the blood of Christ, his red blood? And, and you want your robes to be washed white in the blood of the lamb? Don't we read that somewhere? Uh, hopefully I'll remember that. But that's in, you know, let me find it for you. All right, take a look at Revelation chapter 7, verse starting in verse 12. We're just going to read an excerpt saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? How come they're in white robes? I mean, what is it about white robes? Why white? Why not purple or green or yellow or peach or chartreuse? What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. All right, let's take a look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, he was the uh, son of Nebuchadnezzar, I guess Nebuchadnezzar was dead and he took over. I'm not sure. But uh, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. This ties in right with Revelation, people, the book of Revelation. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this, I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast all had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Dominion means, uh, it's where the word dominate comes from. It you know, means you're the top dog, you're power. Verse 7, after this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. 
and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamp the residue with the feet of it. In other words, it's going to walk all over and stamp the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. Isn't this just like the beast of Revelation? 10, ten horns. I considered the horns. Behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. I believe this is talking about the, the beast, the false prophet, and the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Verse 9. Listen carefully. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and... The Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white was white as snow. Now, I think this Ancient of Days is Christ. Some people would argue, but I think this is Christ. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. Okay. We're going to go read Revelation chapter 1 when we get done with this. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Now, if you want to read about the wheel within the wheel and the throne, you can read Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1. And everybody, a lot of the New Agers will say, oh, well, that was a UFO coming down. No, I don't think so. It was God's throne, according to Ezekiel. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Didn't Peter write about uh, inflaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God? Oh, yeah. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. What books? The book of life? I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So obviously, people, they're talking about, you know, Christ, the Ancient of Days, garment white as snow, and the hair of his head's like the pure wool. Well, what, what color is wool? Generally, it's white, right? Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 1. Is there a description, a physical description of what Jesus looks like? Yes, there is. And then all your modern demon nominational preachers will say, oh, well, Jesus is black. Well, where did they get that from? Not the Bible. That's their opinion. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God. Now we're talking about Christ here. Okay. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth. You know that? You know you're blessed if you read the word of God? How come we don't read it more? Oh, hey, uh, American Idol's on or Dancing with the Stars uh, or Kim Kardashian. No, thank you. Or football. Yay. The New England Patriots. Yay. Actually, I've never been a New England fan, but I'm just saying, you know. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. I'm talking about Asia Minor, you know, the Middle East. That's what they call Asia Minor. 
Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It don't get any better than that, people. Let me tell you something. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now, I am of the opinion that the false Christ is going to come before Jesus does. And if we're not caught up together to be with Christ in the air when he's coming back to earth, it's the false Messiah. And let me tell you something, people, when Christ really returns, people are going to wail. They're going to be unhappy. So if the false Messiah comes and the people aren't wailing, it's the wrong Christ. Verse 8, Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega. The New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew. It doesn't say I'm the Aleph Tav. It says I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha was, the, you know, that's where we get our word alphabet. Alpha was the first letter of the Greek. And Beta, Beta was the second letter. So they took Alpha, Beta, Alphabet. And Omega was the last. That's like saying, I'm the A to Z. I'm the first, the last, and everything in between. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Christ created the earth. And Christ is going to make a new heavens and a new earth and new Jerusalem. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. See, Christ is the Almighty. He's the Almighty. He's God in the flesh. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. What's tribulation? Trouble, problems, persecution. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I don't know how true it is and I'm not saying it's true and I'm just throwing this out there, just something to think about. Think about this. 11 of the 12 apostles, I'm sorry, 10 of the 12 apostles died for their faith. Judas Iscariot committed suicide, hung himself, okay? The only other apostle that didn't die for his faith, faith was John, this John, the book of, wrote, wrote the book of, penned the book of Revelation. Paul died for his faith. Stephen died for his faith. Now, according to legend, I don't know if it's true or not, they tried to kill John. They couldn't do it. They even stuck him in boiling water or oil or something, and he wouldn't die. You know, it was like when they threw the three Hebrew children in the book of Daniel. They threw them into the furnace of fire. They didn't even smell like smoke when they came out. But it killed the people that tried to throw the, the Hebrew ch children into the furnace. They died from the heat. But the Hebrew children, not even one hair was singed. They didn't even smell like smoke. And that's what, I've, that, that's what I've heard happened to John. They, they tried to kill him and they couldn't do it. So they banished him to Patmos because if they could have killed him, they probably would have. Uh, is it true? I don't know. Wouldn't surprise me. You know, God has a way of showing the wicked, uh, you can only do as much as I let you do. You know, and the Satanists, well, they'll use that as an excuse and they'll say, well, you know, if, if God was all powerful, why is Satan still hanging around? 
you know, God can't destroy Satan. Oh, yeah, he can. He's just, right now, it's just, this is a play. It's like a, a play, you know, like a movie, and God's the director, and he's doing things. You know, it's, he, he says that all things were created for his pleasure. Do you know that you were created for God's pleasure? I was created for God's pleasure. It's hard to believe God created Satan, Lucifer, whatever, knowing probably full well that he'd be lifted up in pride and fall. And if you think I'm telling you all this for pride and march around with a Nazi armband and going Sieg Heil, Heil Hitler and, and white supremacy, you're you're wrong. It's not. I'm trying to tell you all this stuff so that you know how to identify who are going to be the objects of Satan's wrath in the tribulation. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, who, I'm sorry, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was, who, John, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega. So Christ is speaking to John. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, that was a church in Greece, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, wasn't Jesus, didn't he, Jesus always referred, almost, well, I shouldn't say always, often referred to himself as the Son of Man. And he also said he was the son of God. Let's face it, he was God in the flesh. And if you don't believe it, I've got an entire playlist on who was Jesus. Probably seven or eight, ten hours of Bible study. Very little opinion. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs, his head and his hairs, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. John's describing what Jesus looks like here, period. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Well, guess what, people? King David was a relative of Christ in the flesh. Didn't Goliath said he was a youth, ruddy, and fair? Yeah. So his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass. Well, you get a white person out in the sun, yeah, their skin's like brass. Well, and they're like, well, that see, that proves he, Jesus was brown. Well, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, the word of God, people. And his countenance, his complexion, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest, 
in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Uh, and, okay, so uh, let's take a look. In Daniel 12, and verse 10, it says, Many shall be purified and made white. Why are the... the why are our robes made white with the blood of the Lamb? Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Hmm. So let's take a look. In Matthew 17 and verse 2, Jesus, uh, speaking of Jesus and the transfiguration, you know, he was accompanied by uh, Moses and Elijah, right? Matthew 17, verse 2. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun. Now, if Jesus' face was black, why would it? Be like the sun, you know? And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment, his clothing, and his raiment as white as the light. Second witness, Matthew 28, verse 3. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. How could their clothing not? black or green or red or yellow or purple or chartreuse. Uh, third witness, Mark, chapter 9, verse 3. And his raiment, clothing, became shining, exceeding white as snow, as no fuller on earth can white them. You know what a fuller is? That's somebody that like bleaches the white clothes to make them whiter. You know, uh, let's see. After, after the crucifixion in Mark 16, verse 5, and entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrightened. Well, they, they say young man, but I mean, it's an angel, right? And he's got white garment. Why white? Why not? Luke 9, verse 29. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. Hmm. Second witness, John 20, and verse 12. And seeth two angels in white, sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Okay. Acts chapter 1, and verse 10. And while they, they is the apostles, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, who went up? Jesus. As Jesus went up into heaven, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Okay. Uh, what is this? Why? What's significance of white? Verse, Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone. And in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Why a white stone? Revelation 3, verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. Verse 5, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Boy, that's what I want, people. I want Christ to confess my name before the Father and his angels. I don't know about you, but that's what I want. Verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and 
white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness, your sins, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Revelation 4.4, 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, I don't know about you, but I think the twenty and four elders are the twelve sons of Jacob Israel, of the twelve tribes. That's half. And then the other twelve, I think, are the twelve apostles. Not Judas, but Paul. And I did an entire Bible study on that. But it doesn't tell you who they are. That's just my guess. As an educated fool of the Bible. Because to the, to the world, Bible knowledge is foolishness. Uh, Revelation 6.11. And white robes, white robes, were given to every one of them. And it was said to, unto them that, they should rest yet a little season until our fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Revelation 7, 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Didn't we just read uh, where, you know, they asked, who are these with the white robes? Well, in verse 14, he said, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 14, 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. I don't know about you, but I want to be on that white cloud with Christ coming down. I don't want to be on the earth when he's got a sickle. I don't know if you know what a sickle is. It's, it's, what, it's like a huge knife that they, cut, they would cut wheat with back in the old days before they invented tractors. Another white invention, by the way. Revelation 15 and verse 6, And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. Revelation 19 and verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Why is white always mentioned? You know, it seems like there's a little theme here, white, you know? For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Well, I don't have any righteousness except for Christ. That's it. Verse 11, 1911. Revelation 1911. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Revelation 20 and verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Well, what does that tell you? Do you know that even the word Adam is a racial description? It has reference to being ruddy. Now, people, this is not, I'm not promoting uh, race hatred or uh, white supremacy or anything, but I'm telling you, if, take a look around. Why is there every group of race of people have a history month except for the Caucasians, the white race. Why is that called racist? Why can blacks and Hispanics 
and have and Asian have pride. But if you say white pride, well, oh, that you're a racist. Why is that? Maybe, maybe the liberal so-called media knows who God's chosen people look like. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, Jesus says, I mean, I'm sorry, Paul says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, Abraham was the father of Isaac, who was the father of Jacob, who was Israel, and seed is children. And if ye be Christ, then are ye, not you become spiritual seed. No, 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 no. It says if, if, if you are, if you belong to Christ, then are ye, then ye are, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I got a playlist on Abraham's covenants, the covenants that God made with Abraham, that he confirmed with Isaac, that he confirmed with Jacob. Is it possible that we are the children of Israel? Well, if we are, we are going to be the objects of Satan's wrath in the coming tribulation. And I know that, you know, that's why the church invented, uh, Satan invented the church's doctrine of that pre-trib rapture stuff. Because they don't want you to prepare. If Jesus warns you, that there was going to be famines, wouldn't it be wise to put away a little food for your family? If the Bible says that there was going to be diseases, wouldn't it be wise to put away some things to combat diseases? And I'm not talking about vaccinations by the children of the devil. If the Bible warns you that there would be wars, wouldn't it be wise to have a little something to protect your family with? Well, read Matthew 24. I'm not making this stuff up. How is it? You know, Jesus called in John 8, 44, Jesus said that there were people of their father, the devil. Was he just talking spiritually or was he talking physically or was he talking both? You decide. Why is it? that all the different people in the world, from Asia, from Africa, from South America and Mexico, why do, why do, all, these, why do all these different colors, the non-whites, why do they always want to flock to the white countries? Why is that? They all want to come to white Western countries. I mean, let's face it, name a non-white first world country. Uh, from 50 years ago or 100 years ago. They didn't exist. I mean, it wasn't until they took all the technology and businesses and moved them to the other countries from Western Europe and America. I mean, just because you take all the industries and, and you build Japan up to be a first world country. I mean, 200 years ago, Japan was running around with swords. They didn't have trains. They didn't have ocean-going ships. They had nothing. England in the 1830s had trains. You know, why are the Af black Africans overloading ships trying to get to Italy? Why are the Muslims trying to leave their countries to go to Europe? Why is it all, almost all the Asian people want to come to America? Why do the Mexicans flood the United States in search of a better job? Let's face it. We were the formerly Christian countries. We built the churches. We printed the Bibles. We were blessed among all people that were upon the face of the earth when we were obedient and honored Jesus Christ in the Bible. And let's face it, people. When we blessed the so-called Israelis in 1948, when the United Nations created the, the what so-called State of Israel, the United States was the most prosperous, richest country in the world. We fed the world. 
We grew that much food. We were the most powerful country in the world. We had the largest Navy. We had the largest Air Force. We had the largest Army. What happened since then? Well, they took prayer out of the schools and Bible readings, which we had when I was in elementary school. We had Bible readings and prayer in Jesus' name when I was in elementary school. They took it out in 63 and 64, 1963 and four, 1964. Um, birth control. Abortion became legal in 73. Uh, gay rights and pride and everything else. I mean, look at America now. We're the biggest debtor nation in the world. We owe more money to China than what the United States is worth. And how did that happen? We took our industries and co companies and let them move to China to play communist slave labor wages. And we dismantled our factories. Do you know in World War II, the only thing the United States was not self-sufficient in that I know of was rubber. Rubber, natural rubber. Um, they actually used to get rubber from rubber trees. Perhaps you've heard of rubber trees, but uh, that's why the Philippines and uh, India and a few other places, I think in South America too, Henry Ford had a rubber tree plantation, I think in South America, if I remember correctly. But that was the only thing we were not self-sufficient in was rubber. We supplied all of our own oil and food and and steel and, and copper and everything that you needed for a war effort. Now, everything's been shipped out. We import our food. We import everything. I mean, if you got rid of everything made in China, you'd go to Walmart and there'd be nothing on the shelf. God's curse is upon the formerly Western Christian world and God's wrath is kindled against us. I mean, you know, you can't even say a prayer in Jesus name without somebody getting offended because you know what? Jesus is offensive to sinners. Jesus said before they hated you, they hated me. Why does the world hate the white race? Think about it. Are we the chosen people? I think so. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Don't be lifted up in pride. The Bible talks about God hates pride. We ought to be on our hands and knees in repentance. And even that's become a heresy now among the modern demon nominational church world. Oh, don't repent of your sin, just repent of unbelief. Well, in the book of Revelation, in the first three chapters, I think it's chapter two or verse chapter three, uh, God, Jesus told the church to repent. How can the believing church repent of their unbelief? Explain that to me. He's asking, Jesus told them to repent of their wickedness. Yeah, he wants you to repent of your unbelief, but he also wants you to repent of your wickedness and turn away from it. America and Europe, we ought to be on our hands and knees in repentance before the Lord. And let me tell you something, people. That's what the Great Tribulation is going to be. God's going to sift his people among from among the world, you're either going to die for your faith in Christ or you're going to die of old age. I'm not sure which I am. Or you're going to follow the beast if it happens in our lifetime. And I think some of you young ones listening to me now, I think you're going to see the man of sin appear. I don't think it happened in 70 AD. I mean, General Titus wasn't, you know, used of God to destroy the temple, and that was the abomination, an abomination, but I think the abomination of desolation is still to come. The rejection of Christ and his cross. 
Christ crucified. That's what the gospel is, people, for the forgiveness of sins. We can't keep the law. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, I'm not an evangelist. All right, people. This is the conclusion. All blessings, praise. Oh, before I close out, the White House petition. Please sign it. Share it on Twitter. Share it on Facebook. Share it on Google+. Plus. Share it everywhere. I want people to think. I, I want it to get publicity and, and the liberal media to go, oh my gosh, white white supremacists. I want Christians to be thinking about all Jacob's trouble and why is white being white a racist thing? I want them to think about it. I'm not doing this to, to get famous or, or pride or anything else. I want people to think. So please share the White House uh, petition. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Turn your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 30. Jeremiah is one of those books about judgment. Judgment upon God's people for disobedience. Now, you know, there's a, a lot of controversy about who are God's chosen people. Uh, the modern churches will tell you they're the people that call themselves Jews over in the Middle East. The black Hebrews will tell you that they're the Israelites of the Bible. The people that adhere to Christian identity will tell you that the white Christians are the chosen people. The black nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan, he'll tell you, well, the black Muslims, they're the chosen people. And then you got the Arabs over in the Middle East. They'll tell you, hey, we're the chosen people. Who's right? Well, we're going to do some Bible reading and uh, take a little, little bit of history and current events. But let's take a look. Before we get into all that, and, and I don't want to stray far from the Bible. Now, those of you that have listened to me for a while, well, a lot of this information is not going to be new. But this is more for new listeners. The name of this Bible study is going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. And he had 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. So let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 30. Verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel. You see, Jacob's name was changed by God himself to Israel. Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah. Hmm. The Lord makes a distinction here between Israel and Judah that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. What does he mean, bring again the captivity? Well, Israel was in captivity in Egypt. Remember the book of Exodus when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt? Well, Lord's getting ready to take them back into captivity under Babylon. Well, actually, Israel was taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And their capital was Samaria. But then you had Judah, whose capital was Jerusalem. You see, they're not necessarily the same people. Contrary to what your pastor 
lied to you. You see, Israel's capital was Samaria. They had a king called Ahab. Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. They had a king called Jehoshaphat. They had different kings, different land areas, different capitals. How can that be? Doesn't your pastor tell you that they're all the same people? Uh, well, if you don't believe me, read the book of First and Second Kings, and you'll learn something. So here it is. The Lord put Israel into captivity by the Assyrians, and now he's angry at the wickedness of Judah, and he's going to have them go into captivity by the Babylonians. Perhaps you've heard of King Nebuchadnezzar. Perhaps you've read the book of Daniel. Daniel was a prince of Judah, and he went to Babylon. I mean, you know, you do yourself a huge disservice if you haven't read the entire Bible from cover to cover. Verse 3, For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Now, when Israel was taken, when Judah was taken in, into, well, I'm sorry. All right, when Israel was taken into captivity by the Assyrians, they never returned to the land. They scattered. But when Judah was taken into captivity by Babylon, well, when Babylon collapsed, God pronounced 70 years that he was going to put them into captivity. And 70 years later, the Medes and the Persians conquered Babylon. And Cyrus and Darius and allowed Judah to return to Jerusalem and rebuild it. You can read about this in the book of Ezra. You can read about this in the book of Nehemiah. You never heard of those books, huh? Well... My fault? No. You want to watch uh, Kim Kardashian? Or are you going to watch football and baseball? And or are you going to watch soap operas? Or are you going to spend your time reading the Word of God? Actually, if you don't like reading, that's fine. I mean, there are websites on YouTube and that where you can listen to the Word of God either online or on CD. There's a guy named Alexander Scorby, S-C-O-U-R-B-Y, and he does the King James Bible on CD. Shakespearean actor, wonderful voice. You can listen to it. You listen to it on your way to work, on your way home from work, on your way shopping, in your car or your SUV or your truck. You know, what are you going to do with your time? Drink beer and yell at the TV on Sunday watching the football game? Or watch soap operas? And watch the uh, husband leave his wife for his gay lover? Uh, well, what can I tell you? All right, so God says he was going to bring them into captivity, and then he was going to let them return to the land. And 99% or more of your pastors will tell you that in 1948 that the people that call themselves Jews over in the land that call themselves Israelis, they he'll say, well, that's the fulfillment of this prophecy. But is it? I don't know. We'll get to that later. Saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. See, not the same people. Verse 4. Now verse 5. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice trembling of fear and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth prevail with child. Does a man have childbirth? No. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Hmm. So can Africans 
have their faces turned to paleness? What does the word pale mean? Look it up in a Webster's Dictionary. Verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Hmm. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. That's the name of this Bible study. Verse 8. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God. Hmm. And David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. And who is that? Who's David their king? Well, wasn't Christ a son of David? Absolutely. Unless you listen to the um, Noahide Messianic people, N-O-A-H-I-D-E. There are a bunch of people that think, they call themselves Jews, they believe that the Messiah is the Jews themselves keeping, teaching people how to keep the law. Does keeping the law save people? Not if you believe Jesus, which I do. So, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob saith the Lord. Neither be dismayed, O Israel. See, Israel and, and Jacob are synonyms. For lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed, children, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee. Ooh. But I will correct thee. In other words, you're going to get a spanking, buddy boy. But I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. For thus saith the Lord, Thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause, that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. All thy lovers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not. And who were there? Who was Israel's lovers? Baal, Ashtaroth, Moloch, you name every false heathen satanic religion out there. And those were their lovers. Oh, yeah. All thy lovers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not. For I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement. What does it mean to be chastised? Whipped. With the chastisement of a cruel one. For the multitude of thine iniquity. What's iniquity? Sin. Wickedness. For the multitude of thine, of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. Oh, yeah. All right, verse 15. Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquity. Because thy sins were increased, I have done these things unto thee. Where, therefore, all they that devour thee shall be devoured and all thine adversaries and all thine adversaries every one of them shall go into captivity and they that spoil thee shall be a spoil and all that prey upon thee will I give for a prey and not P-R-A-Y but P-R-E-E-Y you've heard of predators and prey well, an eagle's a predator, 
and a squirrel would be prey. For I will restore, for I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents, and have mercy on its dwelling places. And the city shall be builded upon her own heap, and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of them that make merry. And I will multiply them, and they shall not be few. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Hmm. Their children also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. And their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governor shall proceed from the midst of them. And I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach unto me. For who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord? And ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Where have we read that before in the New Testament? We'll get to that. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury. A continuing whirlwind, it shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. Of the, wicked. the fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it, and until he have performed the intents of his heart, in the latter days ye shall consider it. In the latter days. That means in the last days. Latter means towards the end. Here's an interesting verse. Second Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 1. It's called Chronicles because it was the chronicles or the, the things that the kings of Israel and Judah did. Verse 1, 2 Chronicles 15, 1. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa. Now, Asa was a king. And said unto him, Now, he was a king of Judah. Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you, while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. In other words, if you look for the Lord, you'll find him. And if you run away from the Lord, he'll let you do it. You turn your back on the Lord, and the Lord will turn his back on you. No problem. I did weddings for a number of years, and... Uh, I 90% of the time I talk to the brides almost exclusively. A lot of times I wouldn't even talk to the groom until the day of the wedding. Never even met him, never talked to him, nothing, you know. And uh, I, I asked this bride, I said, well, when you do the wedding ceremony, would you like to have a uh, civil, non-religious wedding ceremony? Or would you like to have a Christian ceremony with Bible readings? And she says, oh, I absolutely want a civil, non-religious wedding. I don't want God anywhere near my marriage. I probably should have spoke up and said something, but uh, I was thinking, well, I'm sure God's going to honor your request. What can I tell you? Verse 3. Now for a long season Israel hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without the law. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, 
he was found of them. Hmm. And in all those times there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. And nation was destroyed of nation, and city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. Be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols. When it says he put them away, it means he didn't put them in the closet for future use. It means he destroyed them. And put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. Hmm. Oh, yeah. God wants us to put away our strange gods. He's a jealous God. Isn't that in the Ten Commandments? He's a jealous God. All right, so you don't know who Jacob is? Genesis 35 and verse 10. And then we're going to read verse 32, I mean 22. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. Israel basically means prince with God or rules with God. Uh, let's see. Verse 22. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. So Jacob had 12 sons. And they were the 12 tribes of Israel, period. All right, turn to Genesis chapter 17, starting in verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old, and 9, 99 years old, right? The Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant. What's a covenant? It's a promise. It's like a contract. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now, I got an observation here. Now, the Arabs claim descent from Abraham, and I can believe that through Ishmael. And the Jews claim descent from Abraham, and Judah, and there's uh, a sect within Christianity that calls themselves uh, identity, and they claim descent from Abraham. Okay. But it says, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. If there's one little Middle Eastern Jewish state, Israeli state, one is one many. Where's all these many nations of Abraham? Where are they? One little Jewish state in the Middle East created by the United Nations in 1948. I mean, before 1948, there was zero. According to denominational preachers, where's all these many nations of Abraham? Where are they? Does one make many? No, absolutely not. 
So either the Bible lied or the denominational preachers don't know what they're talking about. You can figure out what you want to do with that little piece of information. Verse 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Okay. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed, children, after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. Well, back in the Old Testament, it was circumcision of the flesh. In the New Testament, we're told to be circumcised in the heart or of the spirit. Okay, so, hmm. Let's skip down the verse. Uh, well, let's see. All right, uh, let's see. All right, and let's see, verse... Uh, Oh, we'll read it again, verse 10. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. Well, you know, the Arabs practice female circumcision. Where's that in the Bible? It's not. It's, I call it genital mutilation myself. But, uh, yeah, if you want to do some research on that, you can. Well, verse 11, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my, circum and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah, Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, plural. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Oh yeah. You're going to have a hundred-year-old father and a ninety-year-old mom? Uh, well... With God is anything impossible? And Abraham said unto the God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. See, Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn son by Hagar, the Egyptian woman. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall indeed, shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. 
Not Ishmael. Nope. Verse 20. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. And I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. With Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Not He made his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac. Not Ishmael, but God said he was going to bless Ishmael. He said he was going to make him fruitful, multiply him. Twelve princes shall he beget and make him a great nation. Does that apply to the Muslim world today, the Arabs? Well, I shouldn't say Muslim. I should say the Arabic world. Do you know there are hundreds of millions of Arabs? How come there's a paltry 12 to 15 million Jews? I thought if, if they are the children of Isaac with this covenant and many nations, how come there's hundreds of millions of Arabs and only a few million paltry Jews? What's up? Did God break his promise here in Genesis? Or are we thinking the wrong things about the wrong people? Did God break his promise? Or have we failed to identify who the children of Isaac are? And who the children of Ishmael are. See, the Arabs are, they fit the description of Ishmael. But God's covenant was not with Ishmael. It was with Isaac. Now, if you're interested, I've got a bunch of playlists on my YouTube channel that go into in-depth studies of some of the topics that I'm covering here. But if you want to read about Ishmael, you can read it in Genesis chapter 21. Um... Sarah actually told Abraham to send his son Isaac, I mean, Ishmael, away from his son Isaac. You know, separate them. Let him go. Kick him out. And he did. He did. So, let's take a look. In Genesis chapter 16, God said, Listen to this, Genesis 16 and verse 12. Listen carefully. And he, who's he talking about here? Ishmael. And he will be a wild man. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now, if your pastor says this is not true about the Arabs, then to whom does this apply to? Does God lie or make promises he cannot keep? I know better than that. Has the children of Ishmael been wild men and live in the midst of their brethren and have their hands against every man? Oh yeah, I would say so. Most certainly. So why are they importing all these wild men into Europe? Well, we'll get to that later. All right, so let's take a look at some more stuff here. Now, remember, God made his covenant with Abraham. He said he would make his covenant with Isaac. And then he made it the covenant with Isaac's son, Jacob. Now, remember, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And, of course, the black Hebrews will tell you that Esau is the white people. More on that later, I guess. Let's see. Now, in Leviticus 26, verse 42, God said, Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, who became Israel, right? Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember and I will remember the land. Psalms 105, verse 10. And confirm the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. How long is everlasting? Forever. Acts, let's go to the New Testament. Acts chapter 7, verse 8. 
And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs or the 12 tribes, right? So Exodus 2 and verse 24. And God heard their groanings, you know, Israel, when they were in bondage and slavery to Egypt. And God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Hmm. Now, Isaac had two sons. He had Esau, and he had Jacob, whose name he changed to Israel. Two sons. How come Esau didn't get a covenant? Well, Esau didn't care about the things of God. Matter of fact, if you want to see how God felt about Esau, well, you should take a look at Malachi chapter 1. Matter of fact, let's take a look at that real quick. You know, that you hear the people say, well, you know, God loves everybody. Really? Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. The burden of of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob and I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. And if you look in the Bible, the Bible says that a man's heritage are his children. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Don't believe it? Psalms 127 and verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. All right, so what about the uh, dragons of the wilderness? Well, the uh, Bible tells you what the dragon is, right? But if you're not sure, Revelation 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So Esau is in big trouble, if you ask me. Because we read, didn't we read Malachi 1 and verse 3, And I hated Esau, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Oh, remember that next time somebody tells you, Oh, yeah, God loves everybody. I don't think so. Matter of fact, You know, you got to realize something. Esau was a son of Isaac, who was a son of Abraham. And yet, let's read Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Who are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all? God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac 
shall thy seed be called. Not Ishmael. Verse 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, Ishmael, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. That's Isaac, people. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, listen carefully. Verse 11. For the children being not yet born, who? Esau and Jacob. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he, hath say, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith of Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou? that repliest against God. Shall the thing formed say to he that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the, pow the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? You see, Jacob and Esau were from the same mother and father. And yet Jacob was made for honor and Esau for dishonor. You see, Esau hated the things of God. Jacob loved the things of God. Verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now I did a study on election recently. So if you want to, you know, read more about this, you can take a look at some of my older studies I can't keep track of them anymore. I have over 800 different studies. So, all right, let's take a look. All right, verse 25. As he saith also in O.C., which is the Greek rendering of the book Hosea. And uh, like I say, go look at my playlist. I go into some, the covenants of Abraham and Israel and Egypt and Exodus I go into ex detail on these studies. I've got a many, many, many hours of studies on the playlists. I'm just basically scratching the surface here. As he saith also in O.C., I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And who was this? Israel. Because Israel was divorced. In Jeremiah 3.8, God divorced Israel. They were his people. Then they were not his people. 
But now, on, back at Christ, is going to reconcile us back up to God. Now, we're his people again. And it shall come to place, and it shall come to pass, that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah, that's Isaiah, Greek rendering, Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as, as, and as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and had it been like unto Gomorrah, like Sodom and Gomorrah. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, not keeping the, the Noahide laws, not keeping the Torah. Faith, people. Faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now those of you that listen to me on a regular basis, I know I, it seems like I keep going over the same material, but you got to realize sometimes this is for uh, new listeners. And also, I feel my ministry is geared up to prepare people for the end times because the church is, uh, the ministry of the churches is John 3.16, you know, God so loved the world and tithing. Oh, yeah. That's their ministry. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and pass that collection plate around. Well, you noticed, I don't beg for money. So, what can I tell you? All right, 1 Corinthians 10.1. So, did God make his covenant with the whole world? Well, he didn't make it with Esau. He didn't make it with Ishmael. He blessed Ishmael. But he didn't make his covenant with Ishmael. No. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The Corinthians is, is, is a church in Greece, a, a city in Greece, Corinth. How could they be baptized under Moses? Huh? It means some of them had to be Israelites. Verse 3, And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they rank, drank, drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. What's the stone of offense to the Jews? Christ. What's the rock of offense? Christ. Even to this day, they are in unbelief. But there is a remnant that will come to Christ. There is a remnant. Now, do Jews have an everlasting covenant with Christ and don't need Jesus to get into heaven? Well, that's that's what a lot of churches teach today. So let's take a look. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Now therefore, if, big I-F, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So, when God made his covenant, he says they had to obey his voice and keep the covenant. How about Jeremiah 11 and verse 10? They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. 
the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not the same. The house of Ju Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. See, it wasn't God that broke the covenant. It was Israel and Judah that broke the covenant. You know what happens when you break a covenant or a contract? It's null and void, period. Leviticus 18, verse 5. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. How about Jeremiah, verse 3 and verse 8? Did you know that God divorced Israel? Oh, yeah. And I saw, Jeremiah 3, 8, and I saw when, for all the causes, whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, spiritual adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. You know what a harlot is? A whore, a slut. Jeremiah 5.11, for the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. So is there another plan of salvation for unbelieving Jews? Well, what did Peter say in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12? I think it was Peter. He says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name, what name? Jesus, not Yeshua. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If the Bible was going to say Yeshua, it would have said Yeshua, but it wasn't written in Hebrew. It was written in Greek. Matter of fact, in the book of Titus. Paul writes in verse uh, Titus 1, verses 12 through 15. One of their selves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow belly, bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. You see, people, when you get people that are bringing in obviously false doctrines. It says to rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. This witness is true, therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed, that means don't pay attention, not giving heed to Jewish fables. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, are the Jews believing or are they unbelieving? Unto the pure, are all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Hmm. Now, if God made his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who became Israel, but he hated Esau, who was Jacob's brother, and he said he would bless Ishmael, who was Isaac's half, well, half-brother, but he didn't make his covenant with Ishmael. He didn't make his covenant with Esau. So who did Jesus die for? Well, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he, Jesus, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, 12 disciples, one for each tribe of the 12 tribes, you're going to find that the number 7 and the number 12 fits very prominently into the Bible a lot. Numbers 12 and, and 7. 
a lot. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew's brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus and Lebeus, whose thir surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and some, of, some people would try to tell you that Simon was an actual Canaanite by blood. I don't think so. He, you know, Jesus was called, Jesus was born in Nazareth, but yet he was called a Galilean. Jesus of Galilee. You know, where you're born is what you're called. If you were born, your parents might be from Germany. But if you came to America, you'd be called an American, right? You know, so Jesus was uh, born in Nazareth, but he was called of Galilee. You know, Jesus the Gal Galilean. So Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Didn't we read in Jeremiah 3.8 how God divorced Israel? Oh yeah, God divorced Israel. But here it says, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why were they lost? Because God divorced them. They were without hope. They were without a chance of salvation. Oh yeah. In Matthew 15, 24, we're told in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. Matthew 15, 24. Who's speaking here? Jesus. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, that's interesting. So Jesus said he was sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Abraham confirmed with Isaac, confirmed with Jacob, who became Israel. Now, who are these people? You know, like I mentioned earlier, you've got all kinds of different groups saying that they are Israel. Who are they? Does the Bible give you clues as to who these people are? Absolutely, they do. it does. So, I guess we're going to make this a part one. You know, I, those of you that listen to me a long time, uh, a lot of this information is not new to you, but I'm in part two, I'm going to identify from the Bible alone who is Israel. And then probably at, in part three, or maybe part two, I don't know, I'm going to go into the latter days, the end times, the time of Jacob's trouble. And I think it's very important to identify who Jacob Israel is, and then point out what was prophesied for the future, what would happen to them. And I think it's already starting to pass, come to pass. So, all right, we're going to make this the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. I guess this is going to be the introduction. So, all right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you want to know what I believe, I believe every word in the King James Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22. And if you want to, you can look up the Apostles' Creed. It means I believe. When you see the word Catholic there, well, the word Catholic just means universal. It's not talking about the church at Rome with a pope. Uh, they might have adopted the word Catholic, but that doesn't mean they are. I mean, look at, you know, a hundred years ago, the word gay meant happy. 
Nowadays, the modern usage of the word gay means a sodomite. So, you know, uh, what can I tell you? So, all right, well, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministry, signing off. In Jesus' name, amen.